So I'm Stephen Wagner. I'm one of the partners at Arc Studios and Gallery in San Francisco, along with Michael Yoakum and Priscilla Otani. And we welcome you to the uh, second artist talk in our series. Tonight we have uh, Natalie Fabry, Jen King, Barbara Pollock Lewis, and Deborah Cook Shapiro, who will be talking about um, their artwork. And, and we'll be looking at pieces that are in the gallery on display during the group exhibition. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. So Natalie is our first artist. So Natalie, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself, please introduce yourself. Tell us how you came to art. Tell us about your process and your medium. And then tell us about the pieces that are in the exhibition. So welcome, Natalie. Thank you, Stephen. I'm Natalie Fabry, and how I got to ARC is actually a great story. I had a studio in the Mission District of San Francisco, and I really loved it. But I had open studios there, and I didn't have the foot traffic I was hoping for. So I started thinking about it that night, like really hard. I was thinking about it. I need to find a new solution. I thought, Next year, I'm just gonna rent out a space somewhere where there's just more foot traffic. And so I thought about it, I went to sleep. Next morning, you know, the day goes on normally and I get a text from Jen King, Jen King who's going to be speaking in a few minutes. And she's like, hey, I need a studio mate. How much do you like your mission studio? Because um, you're at the top of my list if you wanna join ARC. And I was just like, yes, thank you universe. This was perfect. So um, I came to visit, I, I knew Ark already for years. So I knew her space. I came to see it, you know, with different eyes this time and accepted and moved in in February. So I'm fairly new. And then uh, COVID hit right after. <laughs> but it's been great because with Ark, there's been such a sense of community and, uh, I just feel like this is where my career is going. It's been, it's been really great being here. So um, as far as my artwork goes, uh, traditionally I've been called a uh, urban landscape artist. I mostly paint cities and this is what I was doing for many years. Um, but over the years I've been changing a little bit. Things have been just getting brighter. Um, for example, I'll take a photo. I work from photos in the city and um, the street will be a recognizable place, but I changed the colors around. And then I noticed that I was starting to paint everything at dusk. Basically everything is at dusk because I really like color and light. And that idea of windows um, lighting up in the evening, right when the sun is setting, that was, um, it brought out like a lot of cozy feelings. And so I was just painting this obsessively, one could say. So now most of my paintings are that way. Um, and then recently, since I've been at ARC, I've been getting more and more surreal. At first, about a year ago, it started yeah. with, I was painting flowers and they were on the ground like normal flowers. Uh, and now they're kind of going over houses. Nature's creeping up and um, taking over. Houses are starting to disintegrate rather than a regular San Francisco street. I still use the Victorians, but I kind of use them as, as maybe my core. Somebody had told me once, if you dream of a house that it, you're actually seeing yourself, you're, that it's part of you, and if the house is super messy, it says something about it. Or uh, So maybe in my paintings, what I'm starting to realize is these Victorian houses are just part of me. And so they are, uh, I'm kind of projecting myself in, in these streets. Uh, and most of my paintings are devoid of people, actually. It's really all about the colors and light. Um, so yeah, when we look at my paintings, I'll be able to talk a little bit more of that. Um, so even though I'm getting to a point where it's the loss of specific places, uh, I think it doesn't mean it's like forever gone. So I'm getting a little more surreal now, but a painting I'm working on right now is an alleyway in Chinatown. And that is, is it's pretty specific. So it doesn't mean that I'm 
going away from that completely. All right, so this painting is a painting I did about a year ago, and it's when I was starting to feel like things were getting a more, more surreal. You know, the angle of the house being crooked. And the title of this is um, Memories of a Good Day. And I remember this, I was driving and actually stopped the car to take a photo because I really liked uh, how the light was hitting the building. And then, um, and this is still an example of there's still little flowers growing, but the, the, there's roses starting to, um, to float and giant flowers that kind of represent the stars at the same time. So this is a, a good example of the transition I started taking from traditional streets to, to something a little more surreal. This is my latest painting. Um, it's called Transfiguration and Resolution. And um, this is a clear example of nature creeping up on my Victorians. Um, this is a uh, Victorian from my own head. And as I was painting, I was really concentrating on light and making things glow. And then it kind of developed on its own. And I realized I was really painting about California because a lot of my family's from Canada. And of course I keep thinking I should go back to Canada. And, um, but the truth is I really love California. I love the nature here. And I love the Victorians and I, I love my life here. So I think this was kind of a resolution that this is where I really belong right now. And um, yeah, it's, I just finished it actually for this show. This is an example of the flowers going over the house. Um, in this painting, I did this during uh, the, the quarantine and I felt like, why were we staying at home? Why were we staying at home? It's because we're trying to protect ourselves, but we're protecting others as well. And so home became a sanctuary, which is the name of this, this painting. And I felt it more so with these flowers kind of protecting us, but they're also glowing. They're, they're bringing light into the house that's completely lit. Um, there's a sun in the background. And so, um, again, protection and coziness and feeling, um, feeling like it's a sanctuary, home was. I, this one is called Waves in the Mission. I did a project recently called The Mission Kiss, where I had about 100 artists put up hearts of people kissing all over the mission. And we did a big event, and it was really successful. If you hadn't heard about it, you can look it up, uh, the Mission Kiss on Instagram. Um, and I was painting and this wave came up and I said, oh, waves in the mission. And somebody said, yes, you certainly did that. So I called it waves in the mission. And I added a little heart, yeah. And this one is the third in a series I did where my houses were disintegrating and in this one exploding, shattering actually. Um, Again, it is it's still a house, there are Victorian elements, but this one takes place in a completely different environment. Um, what I can say about this painting is that it is a, a feeling of betrayal that I had from a friend and it influenced me to make this, but there's still hope. These little flowers are actually flowers of light. So, Things may shatter and grow cold, but you know, life moves on. Everything ends up being all right. And that's what this painting is. Okay. Um, so Natalie, I noticed that all, all your pieces are pretty bright and colorful. Can you tell us what, how you, why you're drawn to color? You know? I, I blame my dad mostly because he traveled around the world and brought back paintings from everywhere. And, and we traveled around the world a lot. And uh, he had, uh, paintings from Africa and Haiti and South America and everything was super bright. And all the painters he introduced me to like Van Gogh, Gauguin, everything was bright. And I would, as a kid, sit and stare at these really bright paintings and love contrasting colors, like really, really get them. And so that comes out in my paintings. Um, you know, I got to be in color in, in college because she thought I was too bright. <laughs> 
And so uh, you're a painter. Why did you choose paint for your medium for your art expression? I don't know. I used to actually paint in oils. Um, I just like painting. I like the I like the feel of paint. I really love feeling the paint on my uh, paintbrush or my fingers. Some, sometimes I paint with my fingers too. Um, it's painting is just very visceral. It's very sensual. And when did you start painting? Uh, a little kid. I was, but seriously, as an art career, I would say the last fifteen years. Okay. And do you teach art as well? I do. I mostly teach kids. Yeah. I teach art and French, sometimes together. Great. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that there's uh, basically no people shown in your um, paintings. Can you uh, just tell us why you made that decision? Actually, yeah, it's very mysterious. I'm not sure. Sometimes I try to add them in. It just doesn't seem right. Well, thank you so much for participating this evening. We're very happy to have you as part of ARC. So you can go ahead and mute yourself. And our next, Thank artist, you. our next artist is Jen King. So Jen, if you could unmute yourself, tell us how you came to your artwork. Um, uh, tell us about your medium and then about the pieces that are in the exhibition. Welcome, Jen. Hi, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I'm here in my studio at Art Gallery and um, I've been here for about three years. So I started uh, painting about 16 years ago. And uh, my earliest start was, uh, as a child, my parents were artists uh, here in San Francisco. I'm, I'm a native San Franciscan and so are my parents. Um, the, I created in various mediums throughout my whole life, uh, the, my creative outlets, you know, crocheting, a needlepoint, painting, drawing, cartooning, um, and I didn't touch paints until 16 years ago. Um, uh, I did oils, I did acrylic, and oils just seemed to work better with the type of art that I wanted to do. Um, I took a few fundamentals, uh, fundamental classes, how to paint, how to use oil paint, um, perspective, these, those types of classes, took about three of them. Um, and, uh, and then I just kind of took off from there. I painted out of my home for all those, all those years until I came here to ARC and, um, hit a whole new chapter in my, um, art career. Uh, my, um, art process, uh, I, again, I paint primarily in oils. Um, I like to hand stretch my linen canvas, um, myself because art materials are expensive and uh, that's one way to cut some of the costs. Um, I like to paint in several layers, uh, to sharp focus painting uh, uh, until I get to my style, which is, I think it would be best described as a blend between um, surrealism and imaginative realism and um, with the style of trompe l'oeil which is French for trick the eye. Um, my inspiration, I, I tend to be more attracted to objects or subjects that are familiar but unremarkable. Um, and I like to compose them in a, a, an extraordinary scene um, using bright or bold colors, um, but I think that one of the common threads of my work is that they always, for me, they give off a, a very specific vibe that's um, comfortable for me. I know when a piece is done when it has that particular um, vibration. Uh, kind of, I guess in, in a way you can think of it like music, how music has a melancholy sound or a bright and gleeful sound. My artwork tends to have a certain vibration to me. Um, I like my work to uh, feel like it's interactive and um, like it's live uh, in a way where when I'm looking at it, I could feel like I, I can grab or pull a piece right out of it or that it's um, communicating with me in real time. Um, so those are some of the intent, some of the intent that I have when I do my work. Um, the, when I get invited into um, shows, 
I'll tend to gravitate towards newer subjects like um, something that I sketched in my sketchbook that I haven't touched on or done and I'll make a smaller version of it and I'll put it in that show and I'll roll from there and usually more pieces stem from that smaller piece. Um, so in, I don't really work in series uh, traditionally where I make a, tr a series of all rose head pieces. I'll make a small piece and then I'll make another piece and then I'll make another piece and then it'll just kind of, it's an ongoing series, I suppose. And the subjects that are um, in my pieces are, I consider them my characters, which they show up and they um, uh, come back in newer paintings from paintings previously, um, almost like a, a cast of characters, um, which, uh, brings me to one of the pieces in the show. I had a smaller piece with a marble headed um, clone and uh, the checkered board uh, perspective background. And I um, got excited about it and I made another piece and another piece and I just go from there and then I made a big piece and this was one of the bigger pieces. Um, it's not the end of all of them. It's just the biggest piece that I have uh, to date of those that particular type of scene um, my intention uh, is more to provoke curiosity uh, in myself um, i like to when i look at one of my pieces i want to wonder what's going on in there um, where i don't have all the answers like the beings are fishing for something down in the holes but we'll, we'll never know what those things are you, unless you come up with your own narrative and you think about what it is in there. Um, the hands that are sewing um, the, the canvas uh, thread or, or with the needle and thread, there's um, some other elements in the piece um, like scotch tape stuck on there um, that makes it look like it's a part of um, your real time space. Um, so I like those types of illusion uh, in my work that makes me, that kind of tricks me into feeling like it's a part, I'm a part of that world too. Uh, it's, it's just a imagination thing I think I carried from childhood and um, I still have it now. So uh, the, um, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say about that one. Um, the second one that I have is uh, called Abecedarians. And that was, uh, I created that during the shelter in place. Um, I was painting uh, other pieces and then I had the vision of the fly with the curtain, the fly curtain uh, pop into mind. And um, I became overwhelmed by that image. Like I just, my compulsion was that I wanted to realize that particular image um, on the back of a canvas. I didn't know what the scene was going to be underneath it or behind it, um, but I just wanted to see the fly and the curtain. So I stopped everything that I was doing and I created that um, fairly quickly. And uh, I think the t part that took the longest time was the scene um, because Again, going back to that particular vibration that I, I like to um, uh, have a sense of when I do my work, um, that was the hardest part because I think that the fly and the, the, um, the curtain is a little dark and has a, a darker sense to it. So I wanted to make sure that there were other elements in the piece that brought levity, which is another common thread in my work as I like um, to feel that there's something in there that brings levity to the piece could be color, it could be something kind of funny. I mean, even a marble head can be kind of a, um, humorous. Um, uh, though I think this piece tends to teeter a little bit more on the um, darker side than some of the other pieces that I have. And I think it, it's because of the fly in the curtain. Whether it was COVID's uh, you know, mandates and shelter in place that inspired that I don't know. I, I feel like I just kind of, um, during the whole shelter in place, 
painting and art was the only thing that may, remained consistent for me. Everything else turned upside down and, and inside out, but I always had my studio and I came here and I worked like normal and I didn't have any, any um, interruption. So okay. um, people are noticing that you have recurring characters in your pieces. So are the characters based on real people? Are they symbols of people? Um, are they a certain age and will they grow um, and age as time goes by? Yeah, I have, um, I think that the ages of my characters vary. I have um, some adult-like beings and I have childlike beings. Um, I use the people around me as my um, uh, models often. So, I mean, even if Steven walked in here and stood for a few seconds, I took a picture of him, he could end up in a, in a painting. So, I mean, it, I, I, it, as far as age is concerned, I think they're growing also because I use my boys a lot. I have two sons and I tend to use them because they're easily accessible. Um, and, uh, and I like, I think the age also, the younger age brings levity to the piece as well. So it fits. Um, with my work. Another question is that you're including insects and snails and slugs and things like that in your work. So they're not necessarily pretty insects like mm -hmm. butterflies or dragonflies. So do these uh, insects signify or represent anything in particular? Yeah, they represent the um, unremarkable um, objects and subjects that I touched on earlier that I like to glorify. So I, I I love beautiful butterflies and they're always noticed anyways, but I like to pull something that's less noticeable, like a snail, um, a fly, uh, even an old dish rag and, and put it in a, um, in a scene that is uh, extraordinary and um, brings, a, diff brings a, a, a new life to it and a new perspective. Um, maybe it's an underdog thing that I tend to be attracted to, um, kind of uh, cheering it on. I'm not sure why. I just, I like um, to go against that grain, I guess, of grabbing the most beautiful thing, an object and subject, and painting it. I okay. want to buy the unremarkable thing. And we also notice that um, many of your pieces include the back side of a canvas painted on the front of your canvas. So could you tell us about why you decided to do that? Uh, the, actually, that, I think that was a com, well, I've seen that in other Trump Loy artwork, old Trump Loy artwork. Uh, I've seen that subject quite a bit. Um, and I came upon that when I believe someone thought that I actually painted that already. And that was a mistake because I hadn't painted uh, that subject before. So I went ahead and kind of uh, did it. I just painted it and I did it in my um, style. And it just kind of went from there. After that, I, it, it, it became itself, itself another character. So the backside of a canvas uh, was just another character that adds to the illusion of uh, uh, of being in my personal space, making me feel like it's actually there. Okay, Jen, well, thank you so much for uh, participating in the Artist Talk tonight. We learned a lot about your pieces and the process that you've, uh, or what inspires you. So thank you so much. And you can uh, mute yourself now. And Barbara Pollock <laughs> Lewis is our next artist. So Barbara, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us how you came to your artwork. Uh, your process, and then the pieces that are in the exhibition. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, um, so, um, so I've been an artist as long as I can remember. Um, I've always been drawing and painting and making stuff. Um, it's really kind of like my happy place. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's never something that I didn't consider myself to be was an artist. Um, and I guess when I was about 15, I started taking life drawing classes and I was pretty much obsessed with the figure and life drawing. Um, and then I ended up applying to arts. I went to art school uh, on the East Coast and actually decided to um, study animation and, um, and film with like a minor in photography um, because I thought it would be fun to have like a, a challenge. 
because <laughs> um, I felt like a drawing is my skill, but now I want to take it to some a different level. Um, and so I did a lot of, uh, I did animation uh, as my major. And then by the time I got out of school, that was no longer what I wanted to do anymore. Um, and then when I moved to California, I decided to become an illustrator. So um, I was an illustrator for about 20 years. I did book covers. I did um, a lot of books about teenagers and puberty for some reason. Um, and I did uh, editorial, all kinds of illustration. And then um, a few years ago, I'd say about five years ago, I started, I decided that I wanted to do more of my own personal work and I got back into painting again. And um, because all the, the illustration that I was doing was more digital, I would actually uh, do digital illustration on a tablet using like Photoshop or Painter to sort of simulate those kinds of materials. Um, so then um, around 2015, I started painting um, a lot more and then I started teaching and doing illustration a lot less and got a studio and um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so what was the next question? The process? Yep. Yes. Okay. So, um, I mostly work in oils. Um, I love mixing paint. I just love the quality of the oils. It's, it's kind of like, I think of it as like kind of delicious, um, and smooth and I just really enjoy it. Um, but I also, um, I've also worked in collage. I also still continue to draw. I try to draw every day. Um, my latest, um, <laughs> my latest obsession is drawing with watercolor pencils and using like a more of a watercolor medium um, because that's something that I, is very uh, portable. But, uh, but most of the pieces in the show are oil and then there's a, one collage in the show. Um, and um, so um, before 2016, most of my inspiration was from, I have a huge collection of of magazines um, from the 1950s through 70s. Um, and um, I've been sort of obsessed with old ads and kind of retro imagery, like housewives and, you know, stuff from the past. Um, so I did a lot of paintings based on uh, the things that I was kind of obsessed with. Um, but then around 2016, after the election, I found myself, I, I found myself photographing um, people screaming. <laughs> so my subject matter kind of changed radically after the election. It, was, it became kind of an obsession for me to capture people screaming and myself, it started with my photographing myself screaming and then I had people sending me screams and then I also had people coming to my studio and volunteering to scream for me and then I photographed them. And then I would take those photos, bring them through Photoshop, change the colors to what I wanted it to be, and then work off of those to make paintings. So, um, so I've worked in a lot of different ways. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Lately, I've been painting TV dinners again. I, I kind of played out the scream thing for about two years. That's the only thing I was really painting was people screaming. And it kind of, I, I sort of took it through a progression of, people all different ages, races, uh, walks of life screaming. I've done all different sizes of screams. Um, so now I'm back to painting uh, more sort of retro images again and trying to explore what my next, what my next move is gonna be in terms of my theme. Yeah, this is one of my screams. This is one of the later ones. Um, yeah, she came to my studio. She was very shy. And I found that the people that are the shyest people tend to have the most uh, genuine responses and the most sort of um, blood curdling screams. So that was, <laughs> it was as cathartic for me to paint her as it was for her to scream, I, I believe. So this is also from the retro series, um, one of the ads um, that I found that had, I, I did a series of what I called updos, and they were women with these like very kind of bouffant hairdos or wigs, sort of exaggerated. Um, yeah, so this is one of those. Um, this is w what I call my story of beauty series. Okay, so during the pandemic, I just couldn't bring myself to 
uh, go to the studio for some reason and um, I just didn't feel like oil painting was what I wanted to be doing. I didn't want to bring the oil paints back. I actually brought them back to my house, but it was just impossible to work that way uh, because I have cats and I have kids and it just was too chaotic. Um, so I ended up starting to do these collages um, that were, they're sort of like portrait collages. Um, and this is actually a portrait of a young woman that I worked with at the library. I also work as a teacher and she was one of my colleagues. And so I was, I had shot a series of photos of her and I really just wanted to, to do a portrait of her. So this was one of the, I did a whole series of these during the pandemic. And this is one of my TV dinners. I've also done a whole series of TV dinners. I find that I kind of obsess over one particular thing. And so um, this is one of the early ones I did, but later on uh, my husband suggested to me that I start painting them on boards, like TV tray kind of feeling. Um, so the, the ones that I've done since then have all been on uh, boards or trays. This is one of, that has like uh, chicken nuggets. <laughs> And the last one is just a study of peas. <laughs> so I have a lot of studies. Of, I have one that's French fries. I have popcorn. I have peas. Um, I, I, you know, so again, it's just sort of like a study. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. So you talked about your TV trays. So tell us about your concept of doing those, customizing those and having a menu. Oh, yeah. So if you go to my website, um, there's a area on my website where you can click and you can uh, decide what you'd like me to paint. So there's a whole menu associated with it. And I designed the menu to look kind of like a menu you'd get at a diner. So it's sort of a retro 50s style menu. Uh, and you can pick from a variety of different types of things that you would get in a TV dinner. Uh, you know, um, uh, Salisbury steak or mashed potatoes. Um, there's different categories. There's a dessert category for, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> so they're kind of fun. I mean, it's, it's kind of like a relief to do these as something more fun and, you know, something that somebody might want to, it's kind of a reminisce about their own childhood with the TV tray that you, you had when you were growing up. And, uh, uh, it's a little bit of a relief from doing all the screens. So it's just a sort of a contrast, a sort of a fun thing. So that's something that you can do is you can test, you can uh, request a custom TV dinner for me to paint for you. <laughs> okay, and then the collage that uh, we saw in the exhibition, have you done other collages and how do you select the people that are in the collages? Right, thank you. Um, so the first, <laughs> the first collages were, because we were in lockdown, uh, the first one was a self-portrait. The second one, and so I did members of my family because they were so accessible to me and I was spending way more time with them than I ever have. And, uh, and I started with very large pieces of paper and I just started working and it was just so great to just be able to capture them um, on paper. And then I mounted them on board. And then um, I had them up, I believe, in a couple of shows. So then I started getting commissions, people wanting me to do uh, collage portraits for them, which I, now I work, when I do those now, I work on board. Uh, with, and that's with acrylic paint, washes, uh, and uh, magazine, I cut up magazines, and I try to find pieces that, kind of relate to that person, that personality. I tend to do, uh, I've done mostly people that I know, um, but with the, with the commissioned ones, I had them uh, request certain images that I would have get photographs of and sort of work my way, work that into the collage. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, your history and how you came to art and the pieces that are in the exhibition. And we're happy to have you as part of the um, community of artists at art. Uh, last artist is uh, Deborah Cook Shapiro. So Deborah, if you want to uh, introduce yourself, tell us how you came to your artwork. 
um, about your process and then the pieces that are in the exhibition. Welcome. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you to all of my friends who I've seen popping up. This is fun. Um, so uh, I think that how I came to my art was um, a little bit like Barbara, that I think I always thought of myself as being an artistic child in uh, the early years. And that was um, kind of, uh, I was convinced by that because there was an all school contest for a poster contest when I was in second grade. And I won the whole school contest. It was a very small country kind of school. But to me, it was like, oh, I must be an artist because I've won this contest where it was about food groups and healthy eating or something like that. But it's so funny that that was what I needed to say, yeah, I've got this, you know, little certificate that shows that I won the contest. So I really believed through those years that I was artistic and should become an artist. I did follow my family's advice, however, to become a teacher. <laughs> that was the very strong vibe of, um, you know, it's great that you want to be an artist for fun, but I did become a teacher and I did love uh, pretty much only teaching art. And I was teaching in a suburb of St. Louis and every chance I got, I would go myself or um, find ways to take the kids on field trips. They were preteen uh, students and to go to the museum. So in the St. Louis Art Museum, usually it's the tra traditional paintings and things that were, you know, historic and things I could teach about. But on one of those trips, I went into one of the galleries and saw a painting by Eric Fischel that must have just been recently acquired, you know, in those years, it was the late 70s or maybe early 80s, but it must have been a recent uh, new acquisition by Eric Fischel who paints contemporary figures who looked uh, to be in suburban narrative stories that really showed kind of the darker side of suburban American life. And it just, a, a bell went off within me of, you can paint about things that are real and that are truthful and that you don't have to paint about a perfect life or you don't have to paint about something magnificent or mythological or beautiful. You can actually paint truth and activity and, um, from that moment, I think I decided, you know, it's so much more important for me to learn whatever it takes to get to the point that I could paint a figure that looks modern and contemporary and make that be my life. So that was um, probably the last year that I was a school teacher in the traditional way. And I moved to California and found a way to start um, taking classes in art schools. And I was I had majored in elementary education, but children's literature was my love at that time. And I assumed I would illustrate and go down the road again, like what Barbara was doing. But it really didn't fit my temperament and my way of working to, to follow the, I felt like it required very tight drawing, very, very um, uh, small and tight and deadline drawings that were on other people's topics and it, it wasn't making me very happy and I had uh, signed up for some classes in Italy and just um, for the first time painted in oil and painted in a way that was expressive and large and just painting to, to paint not because it had to be to illustrate a book or to be for any reason and I uh, irrationally fell in love with the whole idea. So for the rest of my life, really since that point, it's been about 30 years of, you know, picking through ways of painting better and sticking to the subject matter though, of I really want to do figures and I want to do figures outdoors. And um, one of the reasons for figures being outdoors uh, I just feel that as subject matter and as far as what I want to express about the human condition of outdoors is the place was the place to me in youth where happy times, relaxing times, leisure, vacation, I don't know, all of the good things to me somehow um, ended up being outdoors on a nice day somehow and that um, really appeals to me. And when I had my own children, it, their outdoor life was very important to me. And it was the time when I had time to sit
sit and watch them play or watch them fight or watch them do whatever they were doing. It seemed to, I, I like bringing the, the emotions outdoors. So I like also having this undercurrent in my work of some kind of narrative that isn't only, you know, like this is just a beautiful day with the kids outdoors, but there is usually a story that I like to leave subtle enough that the viewer can put their own story on it. But um, I usually have a story because I spend enough time in the work, in the process that I am layering over the top of the, my first pass will come from a photograph usually and some drawings uh, of the photograph. But by the time I consider it finished, and sometimes that's a long time, I have layered it through and spent my own emotional memories and uh, reactions into it before I consider it done. So a lot of the pieces come from memory after they start from a photo and uh, all of the, I feel like all of the expressive techniques that I would like to use and I'm still working on doing more of that really come from memory and not from some judgmental looking at an image and trying to match it up with uh, is this what this image looks like? It has to come from my spirit and from my ideas. The work that is in this show, some of these pieces are a little bit older, but I feel like they um, together are employing exactly what I want to say about the outdoors and getting um, young people into nature right now, because these people all have electronic devices in their hands, as did I when I was taking photos of the place. So, you know, we can idealize about being outdoors and being uh, off of the screens, but I like to show in the work the tension of having a phone or a screen or posting it or taking a selfie um, somehow, even when you're in nature, and that's what makes it work of today to me. So these people, it was on the Russian River. So I was walking by and definitely connected to that theme. It reminded me very much of my childhood, my dad, my uncle, you know, this, this kind of activity, but they had their phones. They were taking pictures of each other. I was taking pictures of them. So again, it became very today that this is a kind of a, an Instagram mobile moment, but it also was a very, it's a very big painting. It's, 72 by 48 and it is loosely painted and um, loosened up in a way that I didn't want to give all the information about the piece. So you can take away an idyllic summer day from it. And um, also I feel like it still holds the contemporary moment because everybody's got a phone. And this is a girl uh, who was fishing in a, in a mountain stream and um, she was, checking her phone, checking her, again, checking her phone, snapping pictures, and this is a, a teenage girl of today, but in kind of the Arcadian idyllic world. And this piece is 36 by 36, so it's not so big. And this is a selfie being taken like in a canoe on the lagoon and it's still relaxing and it's a teenager at leisure and, you know, relaxing, de-stressing, getting away from, all of the um, emotional overwhelm that can happen as a teenager, but yet posting it, sending it, texting it. And that kind of seems to just go, go with the program right now. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, and it was great to see the pieces that are in the exhibition. Can you talk to us about your choice of colors in your works? Um, I do tend to um, paint the calm. And it's like, I think that in my own world and in my own life, especially during the years that my kids were teenagers and it seemed like a sense of overwhelm for them, for me, for life, uh, I didn't always start with those colors, but everything, I always calm down while I'm working. So the work itself is a little bit meditative to me. And if I spend long enough with the piece, the colors will eventually come to this calm kind of place. So I have to think about it. If I don't want that to make a conscious effort of stop, you know, while the colors are more vibrant. But I do think that I'm somehow painting what I need to have show up in my own life, which is peaceful. <laughs> and I do that with colors that tend to be a little bit cool and the 
a little bit muted and the value range is not enormous. I don't, I don't use high contrast and I don't go for the big and bold. I envy that in other people. <laughs> it's like I look at other people's work and love it when it is that way. But I feel like I'm really painting to uh, give myself what I need uh, quite a bit. Like I think that it's, it's for me um, therapeutic to use the colors I use and the scenes that I paint and the images that I'm coming up with. It's something... Uh, even the memories, when I'm connecting back to memories of my own childhood or life, I think that it's a little bit of what I wished for. Like, I'm, I'm cherry-picking idyllic moments and calm. Wasn't always like that, but, you know, that's what I choose. And how do you select uh, what sites or locations that you're painting? Um, I mean, sometimes it just, especially in the years that my kids were younger and they were around, um, because of having boisterous boys living in the city and being at home, we would seek beaches and mountains and, you know, as outdoorsy as we could get to get away from the city or in our yard or in a park or something like that. And it's like, I love parks um, and places. It just seems like a place of calm. And it was, you know, I'm sure it's universal. That's what people do. But I know that for me, it's super, super important to be outdoors for me to call it, you know, calm. Like even in a restaurant now in San Francisco, we can eat outdoors, you know, that's so amazing to me. It's like, there's something about outdoors and it's like, look up, look around. It's a bigger picture than the minutia that's uh, in our mind, you know, eating us up in the moments. And if you just get outside, it's like, you know, the fresh air, the, the big space, the colors. <laughs> You know, I like bringing that into my canvases. So uh, I, while I'm doing the work, the whole process is what I what I like. Okay, Deborah, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It was uh, fascinating to see your combination of nature and technology. So we're so happy uh, to have had you at ARC uh, for the last um, several years. So mm -hmm. thank you to the ARC Studio artists for participating this evening. So thank you so much for. Uh, joining us this evening and we uh, appreciate uh, our art studio artists um, so much and we love having them in our building and we really enjoyed hearing about their work tonight. So thank you everybody and have a good night. <laughs>